So hi everyone, so good to see you. Hello to people from SDU, right? <laughs> and I want to uh, say thank you to Christine for visiting, for accepting my invitation. Uh, this is where Christine and I met in this special issue that she was a guest editor of, together with uh, Yap Ham. The name of the journal is Interaction Studies, Social Behavior and Communication in Biological and Artificial Systems. And this special issue was dedicated to what influences influence, how the communicative situation influences persuasion. And I, I am one of the contributors together with a colleague, uh, Oliver Niebuhr. So thank you, Christine, for inviting me to this special issue and the opportunity to know you and accepting the invitation to arrive. So let me say a few words uh, introduction. Uh, Christine Fisher is professor for language and technology interaction at the University of Southern Denmark and director of the Human Robot Interaction Lab in Sonderburg. In Sonderburg. She received her PhD in English linguistics from Bielefeld University in 1998, after which she did postdoctoral work at the University of Hamburg on emotion in human computer interaction. She was assistant professor in Bremen between 2000 and 2006 and associate professor for English linguistics at the University of Southern Denmark from 2007 to 2015. She acts as senior associate editor of the journal Trans Transactions in Human Robot Interaction and as associate editor of the book series Studies in Pro Programmatics. Her current research focuses on the development of smooth, seamless interactions between, between humans and technologies and on understanding the mechanism and processes underlying communication, interaction, and behavior change. And now I give the floor to you, please. Okay, hello everyone. So um, thank you so much, uh, Veret, for uh, inviting me here. So uh, just for everyone online, uh, so that you know what, uh, this is the scenario. So um, Veret and Nurit uh, and I are here in the same room. And uh, so that's it's a little bit, um, yeah, just that you know uh, what's happening here. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I had a little bit of a problem when I was um, thinking about what I should talk about um, to find uh, the right uh, topic because uh, I work with robots in three different ways. So on the one hand, um, I'm uh, involved in like making robots better, like more usable uh, for people. Uh, then I'm also working on uh, understanding how people interact with robot in the first place. So what the uh, mechanisms and processes are that we bring to interactions with robots. And then the, um, the third um, uh, kind of or approach that I'm using is that I'm using robots. Yeah, the slide should be on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not yet. I'm not, not there yet. I'm, I haven't started yet. I'm still looking at who <laughs> my audience is. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the third approach is that I use robots as tools uh, to study, to do linguistics, to study speaking style, to uh, to find out more about linguistics. And uh, because uh, Beret and I have this background regarding this uh, uh, this jo joint work on speaking styles, I thought this would be a good topic. So that's how it uh, occurred. But if you want to ask me questions about the other things, then I'm happy to ask, answer those as well. Okay, then I'm starting this presentation. And I also thought uh, that, so um, yeah, I can show you in a second. I'm going to uh, talk about several different studies and uh, I thought it would be good if you got the opportunity to ask uh, directly after each, um, uh, after each of them, what, like what, what questions are coming up. Okay, so why robots? Why study, use robots to study language and interaction? So according to Brendan Schober, we have uh, two options uh, to uh, study 
language in interaction. On the one hand, we can look at corpora um, and uh, uh, analyze naturally occurring data, or we can bring people to the lab and uh, have uh, like illicit data in controlled uh, situ situations. Uh, and both uh, approaches have some problems. Uh, so if we look at naturally occurring data, then uh, the mechanisms, processes, and influencing factors may not become transparent from observation from naturally uh, occurring data alone. Whereas when we bring people to the lab uh, and have controlled studies, they may actually uh, lack ecological validity and people may in real life do different things than what they would be doing in the lab. And uh, since interaction and okay, there is there are more logical forms of um, uh, of language use, uh, which are then um, often also directed at uh, <laughs> uh, also directed at, uh, at at someone in in some respect. But um, language use in general uh, relies on co-participants, um, and then if you take this to the lab, you need, uh, or many people make use of human con confederates. And uh, human confederates uh, have been shown to uh, bring with them many uh, problems. So if you uh, replace uh, the confederates in studies with naive subjects, uh, then uh, you uh, people have sh shown that these studies often uh, yield different results. So, for example, in a study on uh, storytelling where uh, Brown and Dell were uh, studying how the, the presence of the partner influences the storytelling, uh, they found that um, confederates communicate implicitly that they actually don't need more information and so uh, uh, implicitly guided this, this study in, uh, in, in certain ways. Um, there, it's just that there are so many aspects in communication that cannot be sufficiently controlled so um, uh, that uh, the human confederates cannot just um, influence or, or um, make sure that they do not influence the dynamics and the outcomes uh, of interactions, also because of the multi-channel um, interactions that are uh, going on when we are interacting with each other. So this is why I use robots. So uh, robots behavior, appearance, functionality, framing can be controlled in ways in which humans cannot be controlled. Robots so far inhabit mostly labs, so that's, that's their natural habitat. So it's nothing weird or people having visit the robot in the lab. Um, and also people's expectations towards robots are generally low. So um, they do not expect very complex uh, interactions as with another person. And uh, the interaction can also be framed more easily because uh, people don't have clear expectations anyway. So robots uh, then deliver identical behaviors to all participants alike and uh, as often as necessary, like for each participant without uh, any fatigue effects. Uh, they're embodied and thus uh, serious interaction partners. And that's something that we have also shown in studies that um, it makes a significant difference that they have bodies and um, that they are being taken seriously. They can assume many social roles. Um, and if you have two uh, robots of the same kind, then they will also look identical. So uh, there's no need to uh, have distractor I uh, items or to disguise the uh, the speaker as we would have like in the matched guys uh, technique, which is otherwise a common technique in linguistics. Um, yeah, so linguistic variables and their interactional and even behavioral effects can be studied in naturalistic interactional uh, contexts using robots. So that's kind of like what, what, what I do and what I want to present you uh, today. So I thought I'd start with a study on cultural differences uh, concerning a pragmatic strategy, then uh, one short study on intonation transfer. So uh, when uh, you speak in uh, in a second language and you use the uh, intonation contours of your uh, uh, native language, uh, then uh, the effects of charismatic speaking style on uh, learning or task performance, uh, then the uh, effects of a facilitator's uh, facilitator, facilitator speech range on creativity and um, creativity studies. And finally, one st uh, study in, uh, that is really interactional um, where 
uh, the effects of uh, actions that that are suited to create common ground um, on uh, the persuasiveness of the robot in that case. So, and um, I'm, it's totally okay if you want to ask questions in between, just turn on your mic where so few people, that's no problem. Yes. So then I start with my first study that's actually um, joint work with Yoshiko Matsumoto from um, Stanford University. And uh, one of the things or what she had found beforehand is that quotidian framing or reframing is a pra pragmatic strategy that she found in conversations between older women in Japan. And it consists of um, when you're revealing uh, to another person a, a sad personal story, uh, then uh, speakers often turn to some uh, trivial or ordinary uh, details of uh, the situation uh, in order to lighten up the atmosphere and also to demonstrate resilience so that uh, it's a coping strategy. Um, so the problems that we address uh, in this uh, joint study was, can we confirm the suspected pragmatic effect? So, so from the, because it's like an underlying mechanism uh, uh, that uh, Yoshiko um, hypothesized on the basis of her corpus analysis. Um, and is the effect restricted to discourse among older women or is it more general? Um, and then finally, uh, what is the effect of this strategy in other cultures? And uh, here we're looking at uh, Japanese and, and US English in comparison. So the way we created uh, the study is that um, uh, Yoshiko first went and uh, identified instances in her corpus and condensed the, uh, the original dialogical stories into something that can be told um, relatively quickly then uh, translate these texts into English by a native speaker of English. Uh, and then we created audio files from these, uh, uh, of, of these stories using a free text-to-speech system. Then we had native speakers read or present these texts to an interaction partner so that uh, we got like the um, native-like uh, interactional dialogical intonation uh, when uh, people are delivering the story. And then we adapted the uh, these um, synthesized files, audio files, based on the, uh, the intonation contours of the um, pro produced by the native speakers for both languages, uh, uh, Japanese and, and English. Uh, then we, we recorded a video of a robot telling uh, the story, and then uh, we matched the uh, video with the audio files um, and once with and once without the quotidian framing. So specifically, um, we uh, created the audio files using this text-to-speech uh, system. And since the original stories were told by women, they would also chose a female voice. Um, and yeah, that's, let's see. As if he were sleeping. Oh, have I optimized? Did, can you hear this? Did you hear this? Mm -hmm. Did you share the sound? Yeah, that's why. What? Okay, let me just share again because I think I forgot to do this. Okay. Press I say button. Okay. So let's see. As if he were sleeping. Can you hear this now? Yeah, um, and then we had uh, native speakers um, speak these um, texts. As if you were sleeping. And then we adapted. As if you were sleeping. The, yes, adapted the Indonesian contour. So this is what it looks like in Prat. Um, so this was the relatively flat contour that uh, was in the speech uh, synthesis. And then we manipulated uh, the speech to map, um, match the, or, uh, the native speak speaker contours. Yeah, then we recorded a video, and uh, since the uh, uh, in the original, it was a, like a woman talking to a woman, so we also uh, found, found a female human addressee. Also, like as in Hebrew, I just found out uh, the linguistic choices um, that the speaker makes reflect the addressee. Uh, we, um, also, the addressee had to be given. And we used two cameras to be able to switch the views in order to hide the cuts. Um, and 
uh, we, then we match the video with the synthesized speech. So this is what it looks like. The person I was talking about, who I had been looking after and who passed away six months ago, here he is in this picture. His wife, the doctor and I were looking at his monitor when we saw him pass, and he was just very quiet, as if he were sleeping. So this but is earlier when his wife kept talking to him, and he was like, I'm sleeping, so be quiet. Don't be so loud, and things like that. But that was about it. I mean, he didn't say thank you or anything, just you're so loud. Shut up. And I think those were his last words. He just laid there without moving. It wasn't like you see on TV, when the guy's head rolls to the side. <laughs> well, you know, his wife and I were there watching. That was the first time I ever saw someone pass away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the second one. I went to the funeral of the person I had been looking after to help with the preparations, and his family and relatives were all there. Everyone was regretting his death and telling stories of the memories they had of him as we got the place ready. When we were getting things ready, his wife and daughters were around the casket, and one of them tried to straighten out the suit, you know, so that he would look proper for the ceremony, and when she tried to button up his vest, the button popped and flew off. And they said, oh, that reminds me, father had always had a hard time buttoning himself up. But everything proceeded smoothly, and everyone who took part in the funeral was very kind, and it was a very nice funeral. Okay. So then we um, designed a questionnaire where, um, which basically um, matches the hypothesis that we had about uh, the, the story, um, that it's perceived as uh, sad but also funny and sad but also nice and warm. Um, that uh, it says something about the relationship between a husband and wife um, or like the, uh, within the family, uh, that it ha uh, has an effect on the perception of the resilience of the survivor, uh, like the coping strategy. And, and we also wanted to use uh, to find out whether uh, the robot or the speaker is perceived as rude or as having a good sense of humor or also as, as, as sympathetic. Um, so um, participants, uh, we recruited the participants by a prolific, uh, 50 in each case, um, or like a little bit uh, gender imbalance. Uh, but the age range is um, quite large. That's uh, relatively normal for uh, crowdsourced um, situ situations. And regarding our Japanese uh, speakers, we also have to say that because uh, the questionnaire was run in English, uh, uh, many of them are bilinguals and also uh, not living in Japan. So um, uh, what we did was uh, that uh, each participant saw um, both studies and one of them with the quotidian priming and the other one without. So regarding the head doesn't roll to the side, which is the quotidian framing, um, we, we found that uh, in both languages, the story is rated as uh, sad, but also funny uh, regarding quotidian framing, uh, that uh, the relationship between husband and wife is rated as significantly less close because of the, uh, the story, um, and even as bad uh, in English, um, that in Japanese uh, or uh, from our Japanese uh, participants, the wife is judged as coping significantly better, but not the um, in, in, in English, and that the robot is um, uh, understood to be slightly more empathetic um, in, in English and having to uh, having a good uh, sense of humor uh, in Japanese. So this, these are the results. So uh, where you see the stars means that these are significant uh, differences. Uh, but yeah, so you can in, see in any case that the um, quotidian framing uh, has a, a, a stronger uh, effect uh, on each of these. Yes, and then uh, can like for English, we also have strong effects, but uh, they're not like, so we don't have any for coping, for example. Okay, regarding the second scenario, they, uh, we see slightly uh, fewer results or fewer differences. Um, so in both uh, languages, this story is also uh, related as sad, but also funny. Um, the 
uh, relationship between husband and wife is uh, uh, rated as significantly more close with the uh, quotidian framing in Japanese. Um, and uh, the, here again, the robot is understood as slightly more uh, empathetic empathetic or empathic and uh, as uh, having a significantly um, higher sense of humor when using the quotidian framing. So these are the, the results in detail. We also asked to what extent uh, it is uh, inappropriate to talk about death and um, people found it mostly appropriate um, and there's no correlation with any of the other ratings and um, we also asked whether to what extent robots should take over important tasks in our society to find out whether people are responding negatively maybe to the uh, robots. And again, there was just a medium appropriateness um, and no correlation to the other ratings. So the question, the first question was, can we confirm the sub, uh, suspected pragmatic effects? Yes. So in both scenarios, the study is rated as sad but funny. Um, is the uh, regarding the question whether it's only older women who, who, who do it, um, we can clearly say no, it's a much more general strategy. So our participants are, have all age, age ranges and uh, are from both genders. Um, and uh, regarding the um, uh, effect in other cultures, we found that uh, there's a similar effect of the quotidian framing uh, in the US and in Japan, just the coping function could only be shown uh, for, for uh, Japanese. Um, and we can also say that the two stories uh, themselves are affected to different degrees uh, by the uh, quotidian reframing. Okay, I think yes. So, yeah. Question yeah. In the chat. Yes. See? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. That's exactly the thing. So um, we can mostly find that uh, people respond to robots as if they were uh, human, or at least to social cues of robots, um, they respond as if these social cues were coming from a, another human. So that's a, something that we can find consistently uh, ac across all studies, and not just me. So that, this is a known fact in human-robot interaction and also human-computer interaction that um, many human behaviors uh, or, or social uh, facts about human behavior can be replicated on uh, humans and uh, robots and computers. Yes, other questions? May I add something? Yeah. I guess it's some of the reaction but it, it, it's not words and they don't talk. So actually it's something that happens. It's sort, it's sort of a communication which should be part of the, the interaction. And I was wondering how, how can we study this sort of interaction? Uh, you mean how exactly the, um, the person responds to the robot or? Yes, because it's not just the, uh, the, the, the person, well, they don't talk to the robot, but, uh, but they, uh, they react. And these reactions are uh, also a, a sort of communication. And mm -hmm. it has meaning, but it is not captured. Like where, for example, when uh, um, she, she studies, like if people have like, Say, um, um, mm -hmm. they don't, uh, you know, they stop, uh, they do stuff which is not uh, recorded as words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th th this is not a real interaction. So I will come uh, to a story where we have uh, a study where we have a real interaction between uh, people and we look at all kinds of behaviors of the people in response to the robot. So here the focus was really on uh, how do people respond to the videos and, and there it's uh, even debatable uh, to what extent it's a good idea to have the um, the person in the video respond uh, very clearly because it creates social proof for others how how um, what is a good way to responding to the uh, to the robot. So um, from that perspective, uh, which which it was a balancing act between having to have an addressee there and then it's also good to have that addressee. Um, 
like being able to respond or like respond in a natural way. Um, but then on the other hand, it's creating social proof uh, to the others. Uh, who are watching the video um, that this robot can be responded to as if it was um, a, a, a human or like in a natural way. So yeah, it's a balancing act that one uh, has to fulfill there. But uh, you, there will be another study later that uh, shows uh, like more how people interact in detail. Other questions? Then I just continue, and you can just come back whenever you uh, you think. Okay, so the next study is oh, it's also joint work with Oliver. Oliver, mm -hmm. um, so um, many uh, features of our linguistic productions have uh, direct interpersonal effects. So we think that a person is angry or we think a person is uh, maybe from a certain place um, and uh, they may have an if, uh, impact on how we are perceived as a person. So when a person is speaking with a um, with a different sp speech melody, like something unexpected, we don't, for example, say, oh, this person is speaking with a speech melody from their native language, but we is say instead, oh, this person is impolite, pushy, formal, or uh, God knows what. So um, our hypothesis here was that speech melodies are uh, maybe associated with certain attitudes, and we wanted to find out what this is uh, in the Danish-German border region where our university is uh, uh, located. So our aim was to, uh, to study the effects of transfer of, uh, of the speech melody of one's native language into oops, the foreign language and into, into the second language. Um, so we uh, had um, native speakers of German and uh, Danish uh, ask the demographic questions of a questionnaire, like how old are you? Um, what do you think about robots? Things like that. Um, and then um, we took the original contours. So he, this is here, uh, how old are you in German? Wie alt sind Sie? Um, and uh, mapped it on the Danish original, which is what Gamle do, which is very flat. Um, and this is the contour that um, then uh, was resulting from it. So that we have a German question with a Danish intonation contour. And then we had uh, two keypons, uh, uh, these little robots here, um, uh, uh, taking turns in asking six questions. So each robot asks three questions and the uh, participants then had to uh, answer. So um, like type in 45 if they're 45 years old. Uh, yeah, and one of them used the original speech melody and the other one used the one from the other language, but we also swapped around so that uh, we don't have an order effect. So this is what it uh, sound, looked like or sounded like. This is the Danish with the German intonation. And in Danish with the Danish intonation. Um, and then we asked people uh, after they had answered the questions, which of the two robots was more dominant, sociable, formal, polite, friendly, engaged, or natural. Um, uh, de depending on our, our based on what our hypotheses were uh, regarding the effects and natural uh, to find out whether we were like, like our ma manipulations uh, were um, like caused the effects that we may be finding. So what we found um, for the Germans um, that uh, the they find the, uh, the a robot with the Danish contour as more dominant and uh, the robot with uh, the uh, German uh, contours, like the German speaking robot with the German contours to be more sociable and more friendly. Um, and for the Danes, we found that, um, and that's the nice thing about the Danes, they don't judge anyone, <laughs> um, but still they thought that uh, if you use the German contours, on um, yeah, when you're asking a question in, in Danish uh, that you sound as more formal. So our experiment illustrates that the intonation uh, patterns, pa uh, patterns of a language are a certain associated with certain um, attitudes which can reflect on the speaker's character. 
Yes, any questions about this study? <laughs> Anyone dares to speak, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you duplicate it to other uh, two languages, pair of languages? Because no, good. Yeah, we haven't just haven't done it. it it's actually we also elicited uh, English data. We have just haven't didn't get around to doing it. There is a chat. Oh uh, yes. Ah. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. No questions is perhaps a good sign. So um, I go to the next study. Uh, yeah, so this is a recent Frontiers paper also with Holly. So uh, here we address the fact that uh, somehow we all know that uh, it all depends on the, on the teacher uh, whether we learn something or not. Um, but the question is, what about the teachers? Uh, is it that um, makes uh, them influence or that influences uh, student performance? And uh, previous work, for example, suggests that it's the teacher's empathy, organization, adaptability, fostering of community, autonomy, uh, autonomy and enthusiasm in the classroom. Um, and there's also, there are some people who mention ch charisma but it actually has not been investigated and especially not um, charismatic speaking style. So charisma may be as like a personality factor, but not uh, with respect to speaking style. And uh, my colleague, Oliver Niebuhr, he's uh, working or uh, has been experimenting with charismatic speaking styles for a long time. And uh, in some of his earlier studies, he uh, looked at uh, the speaking style of many important public figures. Um, and he found that uh, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg are kind of like at opposite, at opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, so uh, Steve Jobs being always more charismatic uh, as Mark, uh, than Mark Zuckerberg. And so we've been using these two speaking styles um, uh, throughout our uh, study. So you can see the kinds of manipulations uh, made here in order uh, to uh, so uh, it's the same audio file uh, synthesized uh, by by me by on, on a computer, uh, but then manipulated afterwards. So the two uh, voices do not sound like Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, but they use uh, some of the, the important characteristics. I so, wish you a very good day and stay healthy. So Steve Jobs. I wish you a very good day and stay healthy. So these are the features uh, that are uh, used in this manipulation. So it's the um, uh, F0, like the pitch um, level, uh, the pitch range, the um, energy level, tempo, um, the number of uh, emphasis or like emphasized um, syllables, the number of hesitation, um, the pause duration, and uh, uh, how many high pitched pitch accents are there. there. And these are the features in which the, the two speakers basically differed. And this is how um, Oli manipulated then the utterances. So uh, here in uh, this experiment, we uh, had the uh, keep on robots explain uh, the experiment to uh, to the participants, and then uh, they had to fill out a consent form or whatever. Um, but this is what it sounded like. Oops. Right. Hello, we are the Keepons. Thanks for taking the time for this little exercise. We want to teach you how to. Oops. And that's the other one. Hello, we are the Keepons. Thanks for taking the time for this little exercise. We want to teach you how to ask questions in English with the right speech melody. Mm -hmm. So that's the task, actually. So the robot is explaining that uh, uh, the task is to uh, read these uh, sentences with the speech melody as indicated here, like with the stress marks and uh, the, uh, the basic pattern. Um, but first, um, there's, they have to fill out a, a consent form. So there's, uh, there are several minutes between the instruction of the keep on robot um, and uh, them having to record uh, these sentences. We had 40 participants. It's a convenient sample recruited um, at our university. Um, and uh, all of these speakers have a very good uh, second language uh, competence in, in English. Um, and yeah, it's mostly students. Can you play them again? 
I'm not sure if they guess what's in the bridge. Okay. Hello, we are the Geekons. Thanks for taking the time for this little exercise. We want to, teach you how to ask questions in English with the right speech melody. First, my kind human assistant will ask you to fill out a consent form. After that, my human assistant will show you three questions with representations of the speech melody. And so that was. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's the uh, the large pitch. Yes. Yeah, so so the, uh, it's the um the, the higher pitch range. Uh, that makes uh, a, a large difference. So, yes. So um, one thing is the, and that's so, something that where I have to uh, trust a little, little bit in in uh, in Oli. So um, one thing that characterizes um, Mark Zuckerberg's speech is that it's very um, imprecise articulation. That's something you cannot do with the text to speech system. Mm -hmm. Can make make it slurry, so it doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so you have to. Um, uh, we uh, tried to uh, play around with different ways of um, making the, uh, or simulating this as uh, um, this the article. Template. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, we made it very slow in the, in the one uh, case and uh, sped it up for this uh, case here. So we had lots of discussion about it, whether to what extent that uh, that uh, has an effect. Mm. Yeah, so that's why they don't uh, sound exactly uh, the, the same. Yes, but what we found, and we were actually uh, quite uh, surprised about that. So the, the way it was analyzed, uh, so uh, Oliver um, uh, annotated it according to, to the Kiel intonation model, um, where uh, you annotate the, uh, the uh, what like people's productions regarding pitch timing er errors? Where, so whether they, uh, the sen sentence accent is uh, realized with the uh, with the right or with wrong uh, timing, um, pitch scaling er errors, for example, when people go down instead of going up, um, and uh, stress level. So when the stress is uh, placed on a different uh, syllable than uh, indicated. And what we found is that we uh, get like significant more errors when the robot speaks with the speech with the Mark Zuckerberg uh, speech melody than with the Steve Jobs speech, speech mel me melody. And that's even though there are several minutes in between. It's uh, the result is uh, very similar to the result that we uh, got in when we use the, the same manipulations to. Uh, uh, persuade people, get, guide them into other uh, specific behaviors. So from that uh, perspective, we expected uh, some effects, but that they're that strong, uh, we were quite uh, puzzled ourselves, especially since you say you cannot um, hear the difference. So it's very, very hard to say. That it's not that one voice is bad and the other one is um, much better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so in spite of the several minutes interval, um, Participants perform, perform significantly better when the robot is using Steve Jobs' speaking style. And our explanation for this is that uh, uh, speaking rate and uh, silent pause duration are mostly related to competence, so that the robot sounds more uh, competent on the one hand, and um, uh, higher pitch range and emphatic accent frequency are related to passion and uh, therefore uh, to a higher level of uh, arousal. And uh, this can then in turn uh, lead to heightened attention and memory in the listener. So that was our hypothesis and explanation of these results. Yes, any questions? I just want to comment about everyone. And I think nobody can hear you, right? I can. Can Can you hear uh, when Verette says something? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, that I studied a. Uh, I studied a uh, uh, COVID, not charismatic, but the uh, speaking performance of uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Teachers that uh, perceive themselves like a group of teachers, all females. And there were so many kind of uh, and kind of speaking styles, uh, but they could uh, definitely say that this one is more charismatic than the other. Mm -hmm. And the other, and of course, charismatic speech makes probably better teaching yeah. If, yeah. if you want to student to memorize something, something or to 
to remember more mm -hmm. yeah Thank so you you found similar effects then I, regarding the the, the perce perception of teachers mm -hmm. of their colleagues so yes mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is really can teach teachers to speak more charismatic. Yeah, 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 this is what Oli does. Yeah, oh. yeah he tries he tries to develop systems that support people in okay. practicing to speak mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Yes, wouldn't we all want to be? <laughs> yes. <laughs> is there a pill you can do? <laughs> yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay. Then, yes, so um, we uh, tried to uh, like um, apply the same kind of thinking then to a different domain, namely uh, creativity. So uh, we wanted to know um, what makes a good facility, uh, a, a creativity facilitator. Um, and also for uh, creativity for facilitators, certain uh, personality characteristics uh, have been um, previously hypothesized to have an influence like confidence, team leadership, and uh, process management skills, knowledge of creativity tools, but there's basically not a word on the role of speaking style. And as we've uh, already uh, demonstrated, uh, the uh, speaking style can have a considerable effect on uh, persuasion, performance and learning task and advice giving. And therefore, uh, we thought we try um, uh, like our work on speaking style also on uh, creativity. Uh, so we uh, carried out one uh, previous study that I'm leaving out here now, uh, in which uh, we uh, studied the effect of a charismatic speaking style on team creativity. And there already we started um, uh, sl slimming down the number of features that we um, manipulated in, in the spe uh, speaking style of the robot in order to get a better idea of what these effects are really due to. So do we really need to know, need to have all those features that in which Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg uh, differ, for example, or is, for example, a larger pitch range, more accented words, and a lower center of gravity, uh, for example, sufficient. So, and the lower center of gravity came in there because we uh, carried out one study in which we um, investigated to what extent uh, body size is related to, uh, to, uh, to the voice. So whether, to what extent people can hear from the voice how tall, or um, how how heavy a person is from uh, from their voice, and uh, center of gravity was one of the features that popped out as uh, as uh, really important. Uh, and so we took this in here because if you ha um, have a lower center of gravity, you sound taller and therefore more like taller in general and more uh, competent. Therefore, that's what that was our idea. And indeed, we found significant effects on uh, or originality, flexibility, and also on the elaboration uh, of the ideas created. Yes, so this is what this experiment looked like. So we gave people a Miro board. Um, so first they filled out a consent form, then started uh, the video in uh, groups of three. Um, and then they were asked, so they, the robot um, instructed them what to do. So the, the task uh, was to brainstorm whatever came to mind when seeing this uh, beautiful beach picture here. Um, then they got more instructions um, and then they were uh, asked to use those post-its that they had previously created to apply them, uh, these ideas on a new chocolate product and develop a new chocolate product based on that, their visions of the beach. And uh, what exactly you give here as an as inspiration really does not matter in this uh, creativity technique. And then a final uh, video, and then they filled out a questionnaire. And what we found uh, uh, is that uh, the charismatic voice of the robot in these three videos had a significant effect on people's creativity in terms of originality, um, flexibility, and uh, like how much or how elaborate uh, their ideas were. Um, and also on the rating of the robot. 
But uh, this means that we still don't know uh, which of these prosodic features that we used actually caused uh, this effect. And uh, therefore, we carried out another study. And th this is the study that I now want to show to you in more detail. Um, so here we are focusing on only on increased pitch range. Uh, we use the uh, again the robot as a um, as a speaker, and since we've shown that robots can be used in all kinds of social roles, we thought it also uh, is like works as a suitable replacement of a person uh, for this uh, these instructions. Um, and then we developed an online study set up, set up because uh, this experiment here was uh, extremely. Um, time consuming because we had like real students working together uh, in groups of three um, since we were focusing on team creativity. So this is um, personal creativity here, uh, but otherwise the uh, um, procedure and instructions are uh, exactly the same. So the task again is visual synectics. Uh, so we uh, asked participants to brainstorm uh, um, a, a, an image. It's actually the same as before, but this is in the instruction video where the robot gives an example of how it can be done. Uh, and then in the second video, um, how you can use this to make, create a new chocolate. Um, for the voice manipulation, uh, we again, we used um, a, a free text-to-speech system and used the male voice with a slight US American accent because this is where, where we uh, recruited our participants from. And then uh, the pitch range was uh, manipulated overall uh, so uh, that the, um, the, the pitch range of the narrowed um, yeah, like uh, in, in one condition, the uh, pitch range was narrowed uh, by 40%, so um, that it ended up with uh, spending like one octave or 12 uh, semitones, uh, which is kind of like a matter of fact reading uh, mm. style in uh, Western Germanic languages. Or we enraged, um, enlarged the pitch range um, to uh, one and a half uh, octaves. Um, with uh, to 18 to 19 semitones, which would be typical of um, Steve Jobs or also Benjamin Netanyahu, as Beret yeah. has, has uh, had found. So this is what it sounds like. Hi, my name's EZ Bot. Welcome to our creativity workshop. In this first brainstorming task, you will see an image. I would like you to note down everything that comes to mind when you. So that's the narrow pitch range and. Hi. My name's EZ Bot. Welcome to our creativity workshop. In this first brainstorming task, you will see an image. I would like you to note down everything that comes to mind when you see. Okay, so <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you can uh, see that it's not um, not bad, right? It's not that not um, it's not that one is really uh, much worse than. Hi, uh, my name no. okay. Again, we crowd, uh, recruited by uh, the crowdsourcing platform Prolific um, and randomly and automatically assigned uh, people to the one or the other uh, condition. Uh, again, we had 1580 speakers of English, and uh, th this time we used the gender balancing function, uh, the, which they implemented on Prolific in the meantime. Yeah. And this is what it looks like. So the people saw the video, then the, the picture of the beach and, and in this open field, they could then uh, put their brainstorming ideas. Then they saw the, uh, the chocolate and they could uh, like above here, see the what they had just written about the, uh, the beach. So all on one page. Then we analyzed the um, uh, people's productions based on fluency. So like, what is the number of ideas provided? The originality. So how often is, is it repeated? So many people said palms and beach and uh, water and sand, for example. Uh, that's then not so original if uh, everyone says it. Um, th then we also looked at flexibility. So uh, if people um, mentioned like palms and trees and um, uh, beach and water, uh, then they're kind of like all of the same category and uh, we counted them as like the same category. Uh, and, and if people had brought in something very different, uh, then uh, and this would be another category. So we can counted the number of categories. And finally, how much um, detail do they um, produce uh, for, for their 
uh, creations counted in uh, numbers of idea, idea units. And then we also asked some questions about the robots um, and um, uh, we asked about the extent to which they have been carried away by the task, were motivated to do a good job, were involved in the task and felt uh, full of energy. And the results show that uh, the, the pitch range has a significant effect on how charismatic and enthusiastic the robot is perceived and also how much energy uh, particip participants felt in the task. And um, regarding the productions, um, uh, there's a significant influence on creativity, like the originality um, of ideas, uh, the elaboration of ideas, and also the flexibility. So how many different categories uh, were being brought in, um, in, the, in, the, in the task. So we can confirm that the facilitator's speaking style has a significant influence on participants' creativity. And uh, we can also say that pitch range alone has uh, uh, a significant uh, impact. And um, like in the study um, with the, like the learning study, uh, we uh, believe that the questionnaire results show us what effect of or what the effect of pitch range is uh, that causes this effect, namely that um, participants perceive the robot, robot facilitator as more enthusiastic with a larger pitch range, um, as more charismatic and themselves as more full of energy. And that um, relates to this um, higher arousal that we were discussing uh, in connection with the learning task. So um, the broader pitch range contrib contributes to a listener's arousal levels and they had an arousal may then lead to more focus and hence more creativity. So any questions about this study? I can only ask myself after the view, after your uh, description is if, if music has the same yeah. effect, because music, I can more relate to creativity than mm -hmm. pitch range yeah. itself. Yeah. Actually, I had the, uh, the same question. I think um, if it has not been studied yet, which would be quite surprising uh, whether uh, sure. music, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. then uh, we should study it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we could, instead of giving them the robot, we can just play music at exactly. the same time. Mm -hmm. And and second, people can be manipulated very easily. <laughs> yeah, isn't that sad? There is that makes sense. But I was wondering, mm -hmm. since uh, oh, we know these effects and uh, uh, these effects, and some and sometimes, um, well. I suppose we have like uh, somebody recorded uh, a video lecture and then they want to put it uh, on their website uh, for students uh, to watch it. Can they make some technical change that would huh? make uh, uh, the, the lecture more charismatic? <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, you are the guys who produce all these uh, uh, cool video lectures, right? So you now <laughs> you have your solution. <laughs> so um, what we did was really like one global uh, manipulation to the whole speech file. So uh, you can do it in Pratt relatively easily. Yeah. So you have like your expert here who can do it. <laughs> okay, actually. Good. That is sitting there. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. What did you think? Is it really worry is here? Oh, it's worrying. Yeah, yeah it's worrying uh, uh, how easily one can manipulate it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, further questions? Okay, one more and then we're done. Mm -hmm. But yeah don't have to yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. yeah so this last study is now a real interactional study where people are in the room with uh, the robot and uh, these studies are extremely time consuming to set up so we can get around of it <laughs> we always uh, try to 
uh, but of course it's the the, the real thing so um regarding uh, robots because uh, they are so because we don't know very much about them um we also don't know what exactly they are perceiving um so when we're together with a robot we have very little idea of what the robot actually uh, perceives of us or of the room or the environment um and uh, so in this study we, we uh, wanted to in investigate the effects of indicating by the robot what the robot perceives and uh, we did this uh, indirectly mostly uh, by uh, face tracking for example so that the robot uh, would uh, like follow the person uh, with its eyes when uh, the person is moving uh, then uh, it would make uh, gestures um, and uh, also comments on uh, the things in uh, the uh, vicinity. So for example, the uh, glass of water, uh, the weather. So it uh, makes a gesture to the window and says, I really like this uh, weather and what the participant is currently doing in an uh, exercise task. And uh, we, what we are measuring is the robot's persuasiveness, um, maybe asking people to drink more and how the robot is uh, perceived and evaluated. We had 107 participants in four conditions, um, and the scenario is a health counseling and exercising scenario. Uh, the robot had automatic pace tracking um, with a, a Kinect sender, sensor um, with very limited wizarding. So um, basically, there were, were very few uh, decisions that the, the wizard, the, the person operating the robot, had to make. So, for example, how much water is uh, still in the cup? That's something that the robot cannot see and but that was quite important and so the uh the, the robot operator had to enter that uh the robot had uh, operator had to enter what the what, what the weather is like um and maybe one or two other things but uh very uh, few uh, uh, decisions in general otherwise the dialogue was scripted and we had um just tested it so so often that uh, we were quite sure that uh, people perceive the robot's utterances as responsive. Uh, um, responsive. Yeah, so no, there was one verbal statement about the weather, one verbal statement about the amount of water left, a verbal statement about the participant's performance, performance and corrections about the participant's uh, body posture, depending on the conditions. So as independent variables, uh, uh, then our uh, conditions, uh, so uh, ro the robot shows awareness of the joint perceptual uh, basis, namely the weather and the water here, um, shows awareness of the participant by just using a fake face tracking or um, responsive timely fashion to people's exercises, like in incremental response while the action is uh, hap happening. And our dependent variables are really how much people drink, which we measured in milliliters, um, and um, whether they respond to the robot's um, prompt to, to drink more. So here's an uh, example of incrementality. Let's go. Raise your right arm. Yes, that's it. And now upgrade. Let's do the next. Mm -hmm. So that's how that worked. So what we found is a significant effect um, on uh, water intake. Um, so this is the this is how much people drank in the incrementality condition, where the robot made comments about um, people's um, like raise your left arm more while they were exercising. Uh, this is the face tracking uh, condition, which had not uh, no significant impact. Uh, impact the awareness condition where uh, the Robot commented on the um, the weather, um, and this is the fourth condition in which the robot wasn't doing any uh, wasn't doing any any of these, and um, so the robot asked people twice to drink more, um, and that's also what it lectures people uh, about. And um, regarding the first prompt, the awareness um, condition has a significant uh, impact on the in the second prompt. You can see that. Um, Incrementality, face tracking, and awareness, all three uh, have a significant effect on uh, whether people take the water in response to the robot saying, now drink some more. 
or actually it said, uh, your glass is still half, uh, half full, uh, why don't you drink or aren't you thirsty? And uh, regarding the um, perception of the robot, we found significant effects for how intelligent, authoritative, charismatic, trustworthy, and likable uh, the robot is rated. Um, and we also asked about um, perceived fun and uh, attempted accuracy of the uh, exercises and also find in a significant effect um, uh, regarding uh, in the incrementality um, and uh, face tracking uh, conditions. So the experiments show that signals of taking the communication partner into account uh, by means of face tracking, incremental response, um, verbal statements about dialogue history and uh, about how full the glass still is, increase the robot's uh, persuasiveness and improve the evaluation of the robot and the interaction. So in the indicators of common ground influence. influence. Yes. So any comments about that? Any questions? Oh, there's a chat question. Oh, okay, yeah, that person leaving. <laughs> yes, all convinced. <laughs> okay, then let me just go to the final discussion and then we are done here anyway. Yeah, so um, I hope that I have convinced you that robots make excellent confederates in studies of um, effects of different speech characteristics like intonation contours or the pitch range, uh, the quotidian framing as a pragmatic strategy um, in the creating of common ground or also regarding the charismatic speaking style. So that's the like the persuasive part, <laughs> but then um, robots are of course not all interacted with by everyone in the same way, and uh, people's understanding of robots as social act actors um, may differ, and which may in turn influence people's behaviors in the study uh, studies presented. So um, I think so. If you want to ask me about this in the discussion, we can uh, very well discuss this. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>